welcome back to Everyday Anarchism, the show that finds anarchism, non-domination, cooperation, mutual aid in your everyday life. I am your host, Graham Colbertson. Now, if you've been listening to this show for a while, you'll notice that I haven't done many intros like this. That's because, although I keep promising that the show is going to come out less frequently, I've more or less kept up every other week, and I've done that by finding ways to spend less time on the show. So I'm doing less editing, fewer intros, anything I can to keep this pace up. You are finally going to experience, in the first half of 2023, hopefully uh, not a break, but a switch to the every other format. I've got some plans in mind for how I might structure the show. I received a lovely email uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to mispronounce this name from Eowyn. Thank you, Eowyn, uh, praising my anarchic eclecticism. The eclecticism has also been pretty difficult to maintain, so I think I'm going to start up a couple of series that I can spend some long time planning on and shift the show over a bit to every other week, and that will happen, like I said, sometime in uh, the first half of 2023. But now to today, the other reason why I'm recording this little intro is because I just got started talking with my guest today, Scott Branson, without introducing them. And uh, I think they need just a tiny bit of introduction before you hear our conversation. So my guest is Scott Branson, an author and academic. Their new book is called Practical Anarchism. And I'm going to throw you right into our conversation, and you will hear, I don't know, 15 or 20 minutes in, me introduce Scott again. But what all you need to know is that Scott and I are talking about democracy, radical democracy, as opposed to anarchism. And I'm offering up my explanation of why I think it makes sense to kind of treat these two together. I'm following David Graeber in that line. And Scott responds with the reasons why you might want to keep them separate. This is also something that came up uh, in my conversations with Corey Robin and my recent episode with Ruth Kenna, if you want to check those out. So without further ado, here's Scott Branson talking about their book, Practical Anarchism. And here's Scott and I starting off by talking about radical democracy versus anarchism. We don't need to be having this conversation about whether it's radical democracy or anarchism. It's more like, how can we break up with, with these structures that are not that are not doing us any good and make a new world. Right. I mean, there's this like, I feel like a fallacy and this idea of like the citizen of a nation state. Um, and it's a total myth because of like, we're in a you know representative democracy um, that like we have to have a say on everything. But like, <laughs> if we were organizing a world without a state, like I don't need to, have an opinion about every single decision that is being made in the, like, whatever the, like, federated township that I'm in, like, (laughs) I don't know everything. I I mean, I could, you know, if there's something that would affect people, but, like, that's the, that's the kind of affinity model that I like about anarchism, where you, like, you go where you, your, like, um, affinities lie, but also where you're implicated, and, yeah, I don't know. I mean, with democracy too, I I guess I'm hesitant to espouse that term. I like the critiques of democracy, because, Um, cause it just has, it does so much, um, ideological work that against yeah. us right now. Yeah. I mean, my, I, I freely acknowledge that there's lots of arguments against this. My, my model is sort of like, you have stolen this idea, not, not, not you, Scott, but you, <laughs> you like, you know, like president Trump, president Trump or president Trump, whatever. He just said that, like, we need to get rid of the constitution and you know whatever who cares but people are like how can he hate the constitution he must hate democracy and it's like well the constitution is a profoundly undemocratic thing so like you can those of you out there who are defending democracy and that means elections the supreme court president donald trump yes one option is to say well that means democracy must be bad but i'm with graver and it's like well no democracy is pretty okay but we should not let people we should challenge it every time they say we have democracy and that's why we have senators because of right. democracy. Ugh. I, I have yeah. no stomach for that. Yeah. I mean, right. I mean, you're right. Like the, the framing of the, the state, um, the United States was all kind of like to protect against democracy. democracy. Yeah. But that's, I think that's the thing that's at stake with democracy that like, 
like the problem is the demos and like who the people are and who's having a say um yeah. you know and then like you know the 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 lesson i guess from occupy was that like when you try to run things on a totally consensus based model you know you'll just like always have some jerk come in and like block Probably. something yeah. and um and like that's another reason why that's like my breakup kind of theory yeah. of anarchism like if you're in a group that you have to block everything in go find a different group yeah, leave a group, group yeah <laughs> like, and you if know? you're and if if the group is the demos meaning everyone then you can't break up with them yeah and then i would just say well radical democracy can involve lots of smaller groups and kind of an affinity model and then you might say well that's not, not democracy anymore that's anarchism and then i would say well yeah sure sure <laughs> Right. Well, I mean, no, that's the thing that I think is really important because I think we get stuck in the kind of top down logic. So like when when I hear like democracy and my brain does think like everyone everywhere, like saying yeah. something, yeah. but like that right. isn't the way that we should be organizing our lives. Um, that, you know, whether it's like within the nation state form or beyond it, like to think that like someone living like, you know, I'm in Ohio right now living here is going to make a choice that affects someone living in like you know alaska or whatever i don't know like there's yeah. no connection it doesn't make any sense to to massify the democracy that way yeah my last my last thought on this and then we can we can get to your book and i don't know maybe we can maybe we can include this segment i think it was valuable although i didn't introduce you or anything we'll see is <laughs> you know i was reading the new york review of books and uh author named i think daryl pinkney i'm not familiar with him and he talked about like Oh, you know, in a democracy, you have to stay up late at night reading the newspapers to see what voters are doing, you know, in other states. And yes, if that's if that's what a democracy means, I am I am against democracy. If if, <laughs> if a democracy means it really matters to to me, who does not live in Georgia, whether Raphael Warnock or Herschel Walker gets more votes, then I am against democracy. But I just think that's not very democratic right. but i but i totally take your claim that like yeah that's what democracy is it's it's voting for powerful people to run an enormous uh tract of land with defined territory citizens non-citizens coercive violence I, I i take the point that that's what most people mean when they say democracy these days yeah and i i mean that that like homework model of of voting like oh. is is like really silly i mean that that's the like liberal um shaming moral guilt shit about voting that like you know like you gotta do your homework to know and be informed on the issues and blah 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 blah, blah. But, like for, i mean you know first of all it's like been shown that people's opinions are do not affect one way or the other what politicians decide to do and uh and second like the, i mean the, most of the issues that we're given are like are, are these kind of um you know red herrings or bait and switch stuff anyway um and like you know i like the I, the point i think like crime thing brings this up that like the people who aren't voting are also having having a say they're saying that we don't support yeah, we, this thing right it's not yeah. that they're stupid and don't know or lazy or whatever it's like this thing doesn't actually serve me yeah. um i think james c scott makes that point at times as well like if someone votes it doesn't mean that they are not participating it means that they do not if democracy is the participation of everyone in their life and their community uh, unless you've been you know indoctrinated into civics you will not see voting as participating in the life of your community and so for the sometimes majority of people in the united states who don't participate in voting that doesn't mean they're not participating in the life of their community it's just like what the fuck do these senators have to do with me they're just going to decide what they want to do anyway based on money yeah i i mean another thought on this that i find interesting is um you know, i was doing an event with vicky osterweil who wrote in defense of looting mm -hmm. and we were talking about resistance uh rituals as resistance and she was saying that she was making the point that voting like we live in a world like devoid of like spirituality and rituals and voting is like a ritual that people like invest some kind of meaning in and i think that's an interesting thing to think about and and like you know i mean one of the things maybe that is like lacking in anarchism as a compelling 
entry point for people who aren't already anarchists and involved in in whatever anarchist rituals there are like that, that we don't have like we we have to have some kind of ritual you know too yeah. <laughs> um because it's it's yeah the voting thing isn't no one i think no one i mean that's not true people vote and think they're doing something i guess and they put the sticker on and like whatever but it's really like it's really just this like kind of act that you repeat i think that's a right on um analysis that she had yeah, I think that's true. I mean, what I've said on this podcast in the past is like, yeah, I mean, I think you should, if you can, take an hour out of your day to vote for the most left-wing person who is likely to win. I don't, I, I personally don't espouse the like, the model that if you have voted, you have corrupted yourself. I think voting does matter. It matters because, because people believe it matters. I wish it didn't matter. I want to live in a world in which it doesn't matter. But it does matter whether, you know, whether the Supreme Court is appointed by Democrats or Republicans. It it shouldn't matter. I want a world in which the Supreme Court does not exist. But in the meantime, as long as they have cops that will do their bidding, oh God, if we can have slightly better people ordering those cops around, while in the meantime, we're trying to create this prefigurative new world. I also know the arguments that like, if you're voting, you're participating in that old world in a in a bad way. I don't think that argument is wrong. I don't have a good answer. I mean, yeah, the purity is like is also you know um, uh, a bait and switch. I think, right? Like, because yeah. I mean, we also participate in capitalism. We're anti-capitalist, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, vote if you want to. It doesn't. Um, your one vote isn't gonna hurt, <laughs> hurt. <laughs> you know it's really it, your one vote doesn't kill the possibility of anarchism i personally like like to talk about a kind of anti-voting perspective just because i think it's um it's provocative and it's not what people tend to hear um but i, I mean on i when i'm like talking to my students or whatever but i'm always like i mean obviously do whatever you want like vote, yeah. vote that's fine <laughs> it's just like let's be real about what it is and 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 also just like think about not investing your time solely in things around voting but you know to be real in the united states like the possibility of voting is like this um contested area of, and over you know the racial order and and there's something there i think that has to be like we have to um confront you know like the way that the i mean the republicans have been able to like basically gerrymander everything into maintaining a minority rule based on white supremacy you know um yeah no so there's here. something that's a problem uh <laughs> I, I don't know i mean there's something that you have to, i guess i'm not having a solution or whatever but there's like something about voting that needs to be talked about my so my cat is trying to play with this thing so <laughs> i'm gonna put it away because it, it will make noise <laughs> okay so on that note my, my i'd like to apologize to the listeners and to my guest scott branson because i launched into this conversation i might be able to edit this and put this somewhere in the middle but it will probably be in the beginning so hello that'd be cool <laughs> yeah well welcome to everyday anarchism listeners and welcome scott branson the author of okay it's going to be noise i moved this book around practical anarchism a guide for daily life I, i'm thrilled to have you on the show i was actually corresponding with the publisher pluto press about a different book and they were like wait your podcast is called everyday anarchism we have a book that seems relevant to your interests so yeah practical anarchism everyday anarchism i think the uh the, the approach is really centrally the the same we are not um we we're not looking for a revolution in the sense of this one giant thing where we all come out and smash capitalism and then utopia is the result of that we're looking for something different something prefigurative something based on uh affinity group something based on the 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 everyday world that we that we live in i took this idea most strongly from graber but uh, mm -hmm. you mentioned it comes up in mutual aid in kropotkin's work and all sorts of places so scott welcome and and tell us about this book yeah thank you for having me on um uh it is it, yeah talk about affinity that makes sense um also people like um <laughs> you know mistake the name practical anarchism and call it everyday anarchism to me <laughs> so it's, you know, there's something there that's like um that they like bleed together um and uh yeah i mean i agree with you like you know the the problem with the kind of 
the what, what am I trying to say? Like a positionality towards revolution tends to um, have to deal with like a kind of genocidal impulse that I feel is um, I don't really want to uh, go along with. Um, right? We can't like really imagine overthrowing all this stuff without a bunch of people dying. Yeah. Um, I was actually having this a discussion with someone recently around Ukraine and Russia, and like thinking about anarchists fighting, you know, and um, on the Ukrainian side. And, uh, and you know, this the idea that like the military always has to be uh, part of any kind of successful revolution. But uh, yeah, in the same way, I'm like, we, I don't want uh, a revolution that goes via the military. Like, mm-hmm. the, what we want from the military is desistance, that they don't open their, their guns yeah. on us. Um, so yeah, like I'm I'm interested, like you said, in thinking about um there's like a couple points that I'm I'm making, I guess. Like one thing is that like, yes, we're already kind of doing anarchistic things in our daily life that um we can look at and find inspiration from and, and kind of maximize, right? Like look at your relationships and think about how you can um, you know, every kind of like decision kind of make towards um mutual freedom and and you know collective responsibility um also i think there's like a, a thing a, a thing we need to do to kind of like disidentify with the power structures that are in our head to be able to get to some of that stuff that we like see it more clearly that that we do tend to organize ourselves pretty well or like we don't need authorities to intervene with every little problem like we can handle certain things ourselves um and then also just to like think that um you know, because the the crush of capitalism in the state, it feels so totalizing at, uh, most of the time to, to kind of bring attention to these moments and in between times in our life that are, I think, just as valid as the the experience, the disruptive experience of um, being on the streets in confrontation, right? Um, to feel like that, that, that we are already living that world. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, and historically, people have been. And that that's um, you know something we can like pull from in terms of like inspiration and energy to continue to like confront these power structures that we do want to overturn. Yeah, certainly the most popular episodes of my podcast have been about the Graeber Wingrove book, The Dawn of Everything, and both that book and the work of James C. Scott have been really powerful for me for this idea of like. Sure, there's this thing that I'm I'm quite interested in. I'm an intellectual historian. I trace this thing that's called anarchism, and it begins with Godwin or Proudhon or whoever. But it's right. much more interesting to see, you know, these. And this again is following Kropotkin. That there have been people who have, you know, always lived where, wherever there has been a centralized or authoritarian or colonialist or imperial project. There have been people living outside of it. There have been people resisting it. There have been people who didn't even know about it. And of course, much of humanity lived even without even supposed, you know, rulers. And it's time for us to to be mentioning and talking about that. So much of my work in this project has been historical in a way that I didn't mean to be. And I, uh, because I wanted to talk much more the way your book does about things we can do right now and recent history. But uh, you talked about, you know, disidentifying, stop, stop believing in all of these things, stop identifying the world in the way they want you to do, uh, they want you to. The other one in your book that I took away was denaturalize. Stop mm-hmm. thinking that all of these ways of living are natural. And the way you do that is, is history. This is kind of the Foucault move. If you go back and see how these things were made, how identity formations were made, how states were made, how the police were made. I mean, that was a big one during the Black Lives Matter movement. All of a sudden, people cared about the history of the police because it just seems natural to have police the way Mm -hmm. we have police. It's not natural. We need to denaturalize that, and we do that through history. Yeah, I mean, like the like sort of cultural knowledge extends whatever the current situation is like back into the past. And, yeah. um, and that's another kind of like, I don't know, like a pathetic fallacy or something like yeah. that. We're like projecting these feelings into other places. Um, and that, that's, I think that that's a large um, part of how this power system functions is to like eternalize capitalism, to eternalize state formation. And, uh, you know, I think like history, I kind of put on, equal footing, the idea of like these counter histories of resistance or um, living against the state alongside, uh, you know, uh, speculative fiction and science fiction as alternate 
possibilities. I think they both do the same kind of work of uh, of giving us, you know, the kind of experiment experimentation that Wengro and Graeber talk about in that book that like is lost. That people like used to try a lot of things out and didn't necessarily stay in one thing all the time or for very long. Right. Uh, we can do that in some of that work. And then also, yeah, take inspiration from the fact that people have been doing that rather than thinking, you know, we're doomed and fated to be in this condition. So and denaturalizing also, I'll just say, like comes from a sort of feminist perspective, too, because like thinking about, um, well, you know, a, a sort of black feminist in particular, too, because we can think about how race and gender and sexuality are all naturalized and and that works through a kind of biological thinking that you can like in a visual form of knowledge where we look at people's bodies and we classify them according to the color of their skin and and uh they're like you know sexual attributes and our assumption of what their genitals are and all this stuff <laughs> like um and then we think that 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 those those labels have some kind of deeper meaning beyond the sort of society that we live in. Um, so denaturalizing is kind of like undoing that that work um, that like kind of happens unconsciously with our eyes, you know, um, yeah. so that we we can uh, you know see the world differently. And that's what I use that metaphor of like a kind of kaleidoscope shift. Like we can like if you like just sort of look at the world a little bit differently. Um, you can like the power structures become more evident, and then you can try to like uh, you know weave between them in ways yeah i could not agree more with the value of speculative fiction for you know for the anarchist for the anarchist project um and obviously the works of ursula Le Guin, among among others and i know dispossessed comes up several mm -hmm. times in your book um have you read uh ancillary justice by ann lecky mm -mm. okay well then i will save my questions about ancillary justice although i would i would recommend that one um, I, I, I want to ask now a, a, a question that I consider very fraught and difficult, and um, you don't have to answer it. We can just delete this. But uh, it seems to me that there's a, I mean, you can call it if you want to, like Nancy Fraser calls it, like progressive neoliberalism. There's a way in which, you know, race, you know, there's, there's a progressive version of race, gender, sexuality that seems to me just another form of naturalization or essentialism does this mm -hmm. does this make sense and i want to critique this thing that i view as you know just a version of the essentializing project of you know patriarchal capitalism but you know the mirror image or something flipped i also am very sensitive to you know criticizing for so many people it becomes so crucial to their identity that the kind of work that Foucault does or Judith Butler or Simone de Beauvoir and sort of destabilizing these categories is not what many people it seems like want does that does that yeah. make sense and yeah, yeah no, sorry, this is go something ahead. I thought about um a lot I mean you know uh my final thought I'll I'll say my final thought and then kind of work up to that but like um to liberate ourselves from the forms of like state and the market it, it will mean giving up things right um that we have right now that are part of this world um and that it might be things that we right now need and like um or or we under self, uh, understand ourselves through um and gain some kind of depth from so um you know this is like a big question particularly within you know uh, gay and queer studies um, one of the ways that it gets framed there by Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick, she talks about how um, the hom homosexuality is like a definitional incoherence because it's both referring to um, a minoritized group that you can like identify and like these are people who are gay, but then this like universalizing tendency where we, where like the kind of sexuality that like could uh, show up in all these different kinds of ways. And so there's this big question of like whether and this is a, is an organizing question. Do we organize ourselves as a minority that wants like rights and, and inclusion, or the, the you know the gay liberation um, tack was to say there's this like destructive desire that in itself is like an, antithetical to capitalism, you know, or in the state. Um, and I think that like it's actually interesting to think about it as an irresolvable incoherence, right? Because uh, rather than because it didn't work you know, um, spoiler alert, like it didn't work to be like sexual liberation is the end of uh, capitalism because that, you know, was 
was co-opted um, and, and then, you know, led also eventually to assimilationist tendencies anyway within the gay movement. Um, I don't think this is like a, a, a really neat parallel with kind of um, anti-racist or black liberation movements. It's a different sort of mm -hmm. understanding, but I think that's instructive thinking about also because gay liberation um, was, was talking about like losing our identities that are put upon us by capitalism. Um, so yeah, th like people, I, I, I agree with you in saying people like don't necessarily want to give these things up or they want something from them because right now that's also how they can get certain things. Mm -hmm. um, some people, right? Not everyone. Um, and this is the thing that like you get from a kind of Afro pessimist point of view mm -hmm. or, um, you know, sort of like queer nihilist point of view or like, you know, Eric Stanley and Atmospheres of Violence is like, says that the world, the modern world is, is structured around, you know, uh, antagonism to racialized trans and queer people. Um, and that that's like fundamentally part of it. It's not like you you don't uh, get rid of that without demanding the end of the world, they say. Um, <laughs> so like, yeah, um, that's where I come at it. Uh, and I also just have, you know, frustration within organizing spaces of the ways that we get stuck on these kinds of things often. Um, while also trying to maintain like a kind of, you know, understanding of like when people are saying what they want and they need through these like identities that are made available to them, that they, they're saying something real too, you know what I mean? But um, yeah, it, it, there's, there's um, I don't know, I, it's, this is something I think about a lot. <laughs> yeah, well, I would say you've not, I mean, you've kind of blown my mind because I, you know, I, I think it's right that like, you know, the, the like narrative of, diversity and inclusion which is like or you know we can have everything be the same but we just need some queer ceos or whatever that seems obviously wrong but i do think you're right also the idea that like uh it it, it does take you down strange paths if you want to articulate that queerness is like inherently anti-capitalist or anti-racist or anti-patriarchal because then that's just a version of essentializing in a different way and you're it seems to me you're still trapped in this you know, in this thing that we're that we're trying to get out of, and uh, and it seems like maybe we're it seems like both of those routes are not going to get us out of this this prison that we are that we are in. I mean, at some point in the book, you write that identity is both a prison and something to hold on to, and that seems to be so evidently true and also so difficult to think through. Yeah, I mean, the thing I guess, like you know, the the way like someone. Who I've worked on a lot and translated Guy Ockingham would talk about is like the problem is when the the sort of mobile force of desire gets like trapped within a, a place and an identity. So for him, this came with kind of like the failure of the gay movement was to um that it basically culminated in coming out as like the mo the political move like, and announcing mm -hmm. yourself. And so then there you are, you're labeled and, and categorized or whatever. But we could think about identities. This is my like breakup theory, <laughs> like thinking about like how you move and change over life, right? Like that you don't have to be the same thing all the time that, um, you know, like it's the same thing. I think about it in terms of from like my family abolitionist perspective too. Like this is an experience I think a lot of people have is you like go back to your family and there's like a story about who you are. And like, it's so hard to escape that. And even when you know that it's not true, when you're in that space, you will play it out and like act out that that narrative, you know, even if you've done a lot of work to try to to, to transform out, outside of those expectations, right? Like we get stuck in those things and, and that that is another kind of form of, of limiting ourselves and, and limiting our power. Actually, I, I wanna jump off from, you know, this idea of family abolition. That seems to me, uh, I would say that phrase seems to be like an absolute deal breaker if you're trying to uh, if you're trying to convince people that anarchism might be something um, that you want. And yet the way you the way you described it in the book, I found, you know, very thoughtful and and moving. So one of, one of my questions is, I mean, this is this is a question I'm thinking about constantly. I think you mentioned at the very beginning of your book, like, is it even a good idea to use the word anarchism if we're trying to get people on on board? Since one thing that has been naturalized is that anarchism is is violence. So mm -hmm. if we talk about family abolition, uh, the first thing we're going to get is people imagining 
the kibbutz or like Soviet Union style stuff. And the idea that, you know, you could have a you could have a caring community and home, just one that isn't structured uh, the way that, well, the new the nuclear family has been only the structure in the U.S. since the 1950s. So we can denaturalize that as well. So how do you do that delicate balance of convincing people that you're not trying to destroy their way of life? Because I haven't figured it out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I am trying to destroy their way of life. <laughs> okay, sorry. Yes. <laughs> but destroy also the parts of their life that that are that are good. Like yeah. you know, presumably they have good relationships in their life that they would like to preserve and strengthen. Right. Yeah. I mean yeah, so in terms of like both of those terms, anarchism and, and uh, family abolition, obviously they have some kind of seductive value for certain people, like people like me who as a young kid, like uh, got into punk and I was like, oh, anarchism, that's cool or whatever. And then I'm like, family abolition. Oh yeah, I hate the family. Like I have my own experiences of that. Um, but but I also understand that people like in this current situation are often completely reliant upon family, uh, like the biological family structures, uh, even if they can be harmful uh, to survive. Um, and pe there are people who love their family. So the idea, it sounds really like the idea of family abolition sounds like, oh, you can't have the people you love and like, we'll just be like in some kind of centralized, you know, whatever, like <laughs> factory of making test tube babies and no one will have care. Like, but the, you know, I just actually had a conversation with uh, Sophie Lewis, who wrote a book called Abolish the Family recently um, for the podcast that I, I do. And you know, the way she talks about it is that the nuclear family is, um, you know, it's an organized scarcity of care. Yeah. And so even though there's this ideal of the family, most people aren't actually like living within that structure um, anymore anyway. But if you are and you're like a parent, um, you know, you are going to realize that it's inadequate. Like the oh, it's a disaster. <laughs> and COVID yeah. showed it to be look, I mean, that's absolutely no argument here. As someone as someone who is living in a in a nuclear family, two professionals and two kids, it's a disaster. It's it's not working. We're only we're only surviving because of some friends and neighbors who are able to to help us. Sure, I want to I want to abolish what I am currently living in. Um, I still I still would be afraid to use the phrase abolish the family. Yeah, I mean, well, it's interesting because you point out that you're like you're surviving because of this thing that isn't what we call the family. Precisely. So it's another one of those things where I'm like, people actually practice other forms of care than the family in their lives. It's just that the way that we talk about it from a cu culturally dominant point of view is to prioritize the relationships of blood and biology, which to me also traces back to like race, racial thinking, you know. Um, and and the kind of, you know, the uh, transmission of property was just like capitalism. Um, so like, you know, we can ha live our lives in this kind of anarchistic way of, of having communal care. Not everyone has that, right? People are isolated too, but, um, but still like not talk about it, like act like, mm -hmm. you know, it's all the parent parental responsibility or, or something like that. Um, and so I think it's important to kind of to bring those things into the frame. I, I I don't know. I mean, as a as a militant or whatever, I'm like, I I don't like to soften the message because um I don't know. I mean, there's like the kind of Sylvia Federici wages against housework uh argument where she says we call we're gonna call it work and demand pay for it so that we can refuse that work, right? Yeah. <laughs> um because we and it's not like we want to keep like the we want to do something that destroys the social order that makes it possible for the gender division of labor right um and so I, I don't know like that's the ultimate goal for me is that like we have to imagine a complete restructuring of all the ways that uh, we relate um so i have to put that on the horizon right and for me family abolition you know actually i i honestly think that the failures of the women's movement and the gay movement um came with their um giving up family abolition and youth liberation as uh, goals. Because um, those were things that people were talking about in the 60s and 70s and sort of like shied away from. Um, so, you know, I don't know. I think that there's something there that we need to, we can't, we can't like seed ground. And especially with the way that like right now, the sort of, you know, the family values stuff and then with the anti-trans attacks and the anti, you know, critical race theory, the thing that they're talking about is like parental rights, which is just so 
fascistic and horrible to hear people talking about um you know they're kind of owner they're just like yeah i own my child um basically yeah um, so yeah. yeah i mean look i this is a tricky place because i couldn't i couldn't agree with you more um in terms of the parental rights stuff but boy does it does it stick in my craw that it seems like the solution is you know progressive progressive schools like sometimes when the so i mean this is one of the places where i sometimes find the conservative message amenable when it's like yeah those those schools are going to take your kids away and indoctrinate them in the ideology and then all of my progressive friends are like no no there's no indoctrination at schools there's no ideology and, that, and that's like the progressive line right now there's no indoctrination or ideology at schools but i'm like what the fuck school is yeah. nothing but indoctrination yeah. and an ideology i was you know you mentioned fundamentalist religious homeschooling i was fundamentally uh, religiously homeschooled that was that was indoctrination uh the public schools also do indoctrination i can For pick sure. one that's that's better but i this is this is again where I mean, again, I like the freedom of anarchism to like look at both sides and be like, okay, you, you crazy fundamentalist Christians, you are wrong. You well-meaning progressive technocrats, you are far more amenable to me personally, but you are also wrong. And we totally. can't have either of these. We cannot have either of these things. And you're both forms of ideological indoctrination. Yeah, for sure. Like that, that's the, I mean, it's another one of these situations where like, like you're right. The right wing is saying something real. School is indoctrination. Yeah. It's not the indoctrination they think it is. Yes, yeah, precisely. It's actually the indoctrination that they want is actually what mostly <laughs> happens in school. Know. Um, know, it's mostly like, capitalist indoctrination and authoritarian yeah. indoctrination and white supremacy and yeah and sort of and gender norms like that's it's a place <sighs> of uh, extreme um pressure and bullying and violence um so that's real uh just like like you know you know there's like something parallel i i don't know i i like to take these kinds of political positions i'm like yeah you're right like schools indoctrination i i'm not like sitting here being like we need to defend the public schools. Oh, I just like want to the, be clear to any yeah. listeners who who didn't read the book. You do you do not defend public schools in the book. You you quite rightly, in my opinion, from an anarchist perspective, attack public schools. Right. So so what we do is that we say school schools indoctrination. Okay, whatever. But like learning or studying, I use yeah. that term. I, I take it from Eli. The way Eli Meyerhoff talks about study outside of the kind of hierarchies of of knowledge in school and, and also like age um, and the kind of racist and colonial legacies of these structures of, of uh, schools and universities. Like if we're going to imagine an anarchist approach to studying, we do know that it's creating a world, right? That's That could also be called indoctrination or propaganda or whatever. Um, so we want to imagine ways of studying that promote the world that we want and, and but, that would also involve giving autonomy to the people yeah. who are studying, which means that there's an, an unpredictable end of where that will go, right? Like we can't uh, we can't say we know all the content of, of what that could produce, which is exciting. Um, whereas the kind of right wing thing is that they want to like it's a kind of totalitarian desire to have everything kind of predetermined and known again to protect against the danger of someone having an idea and discovering. I mean, that's why like like there have been laws around books and learning it's like dangerous yeah. you know than uh, knowledge uh, or like the inside of your head when you're thinking something <laughs> <It's> like <Yeah. laughs> um so yeah we we could just say yeah sure school is indoctrination but i want to teach my like people to um to follow their interests and desires and study for a world of like freedom and and kind of break down the boundaries between school and world and you know whatever yeah, and I look I, again. We, you, and I are in are in complete agreement uh, on on this project. This is just one of the things that I find tricky. I mean, look at for one thing as someone who teaches at the university, it's a it's it's a tricky thing to try and you know, in order to retain your your job, you're trying to you know keep the students happy, mm -hmm. and also you know not do something that 
Republican legislators would object to, and also not do something that progressive technocrats would object to, and also put into place liberatory uh, practices. And doing all four of those things simultaneously, I must admit, is not is not easy. It's no. not an easy project. It's not easy to keep a job, job doing that. Um, you know, I'm I'm also a sort of itinerant uh, academic teacher, um, and so yeah, I've, I've definitely experienced that. Um, at some point, I decided that I'm just going to be like out about what like what I'm doing. You know, I'm like an anarchist. I'm trans. I'm like you know, uh, and uh, you know that that's prob I definitely cost me jobs. Um, but yeah, I think like, again, it's like the, it's like identity, right? So right now we're in a world where like there's schools um, and <laughs> we interact with them and we engage with them. And like, how do we do that in a way that we can like use what resources are there for better to, for better things that also could possibly give resources to people who are going to continue to do other things so out, outside of that structure and like kind of break down those rules. Like we got to, we, we can't just, we can't just like hold out for a purity politics, you know? Um, like I said earlier. So yeah, you go into the school, you're not like fundamentally corrupted by it as long as you're not identifying with the power structures that it it, um, it upholds, right? And this yeah. is something you see, like if you go through graduate school, some people might start graduate school as like a radical, but by the time they go through the tenure process, if they're so lucky, they're like fully identified and believe that they deserve what they have over anyone else, right? Yeah. And then they And then they close the gates behind them and whatever like you can't you can't do that like that that is not the way to to interact with these structures so um like be in them but not of them you know use them like fred fred moten and stefan mm -hmm. oharney you know and the undercommons are are really good about this about how to use those things and like it's it's sort of um you know it's unfortunate for students in public schools and colleges and universities that it's really the luck of the draw that they come across people who, who engage with this space that way. Um, but yeah, I mean, for now, like we can, we can sort of put our people in there doing these things to start forming our like anarchist study spaces, which I would love to do, you know? Yeah. Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm, I'm on board. I'm on board with that as well, but it's a, it's a long, it's a long road to the kind of anarchist study spaces uh, that, that I'm imagining. Um, well, especially like want I want spaces that have children in them. That I mean, we can have book clubs. Like those are cool. Yeah. People show up and do the reading. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry about that. That's my nerdy, also <laughs> professor stuff. But yeah, but like also like spaces for uh, young people, you know, to engage with young people, and also you know, across generations to like engage with. The older people to engage with young younger people <laughs> and learn from them yeah i can't i mean this is an entirely separate topic that i need to not go down very far but i cannot understand the how how we got from the the, the progressive education movement a hundred years ago especially you know the people around john dewey who who is still supposedly the like father of our education system but essentially everything that he came up with that was technocratic and meritocratic has been retained and he also said that you know classes should not be segregated by age and there shouldn't be tests for moving up and out and all learning should be experiential and there should not be clear boundaries between the school and outside and how that man is is valorized as the founder of, of american public education given that list of characteristics of what he wanted i still i can't i can't wrap my i can't wrap my head around it so when you talk i'm thinking this when you're talking about children of course yeah. children should be in this space they should not be segregated based on a 12 month window and then the next 12 or if they go to college 16 years of their life is dictated by the 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 month that they were born in this is just ab absurdity and yet it goes by the name of I don't know, efficiency? I don't know what name it goes by. Yeah, I mean, it's just another organizing of hierarchies and, and you know, like the grade structure is a way of, of enforcing those, um, uh, you know, especially that progress like through childhood to adulthood or, or whatever and, and like seniority as a kind of power over someone else. <laughs>
Um, I don't know, yeah, there's a history to that too, um, that, that, that Eli traces in his book that's really interesting, but I'm, I'm not in there right now in my head. <laughs> yeah, I, no, I'm, I mean, I've been looking into it for a while, but I'm, I'm not there either. So Scott, I've really enjoyed this conversation. We hit most of what I wanted to talk about. I want to start wrapping up. So is there anything else you wanted to share about the book, about your work, future projects, what, whatever you'd like to share? Yeah, well, I mean, the I'll just iterate again. Like I, one of the ways I'm I, I'm enjoying to kind of encapsulate what the argument is um, in the book is like the breakup theory of anarchism, <laughs> which is like sort of looking at, at the places where you can say no and you know refuse to to serve, refuse to play roles, refuse to engage in social things that don't serve you, and uh, and then you know use that to kind of frame a positive uh, way of relating to the world. But like, it's never too late to break up with, you know, your, <laughs> your, your, your lover or your friends or like your family, just like find your freedom, you know? Um, and I, in terms of my, I'm, I'm currently working on a new project that I'm excited about and I'm probably, I'm kind of like moving between these projects, but I'm, I'm trying to write like my next book on uh, Tranarchist Feminism is, is what I'm calling it. Um, and I, I want to do do a few things sort of tracing, like I've been talking about the failures of gay liberation and the women's liberation movement. Um, and, and, and then like uh, tracing that into the current situation of anti-trans violence and then thinking about um, what kinds of anarchism trans people embody in conversation with some trans Marxist stuff. Um, but I, I have my own ways of talking about these things and then making a case for like a kind of anarchist trans feminism um, that embodies the social threat that they that they think we are. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that that uh, that reminds me. Um, I, I watched some, some of my students. I watched with some of my students this documentary on Netflix about trans depictions in mainstream cinema. I don't know what it was called. It was Disclosure? Maybe. Yeah, <laughs> the, the, the Netflix know, documentary, I think. Yeah, they disclosure. talked about, there's one moment where they talk about the uh, the film where, spoilers, but I don't remember the name of the film, Michael Caine uh, is is transitioning. In dressed in his, to Kill. Yes, Dressed to Kill. And um, in his, his, his other persona, his feminine persona is a, is a, you know, monster knife murderer. And one of the one of the people they were interviewing said something like, is that is that how could they think that's who we are? They're not who we are. And what I said to the students is like, I would be really more interested if that person had said, like, yes, that is who I am. I, I have a knife and I'm coming after you, not to murder you, but to destroy your your society and everything you hold dear. Like that, that kind of transgressive uh since is to me so much more so much more interesting and exciting so i'm i'm very excited to hear about your new project is one is one way of boiling that down yeah that just made me think of uh well if i can pair i'll probably paraphrase this line but one of my favorite texts ever is valerie solanus is scum manifesto yes. and she's like yeah. you know scum strikes in the dark with a six inch blade yeah, you know exactly. like that's, like yeah <laughs> Yeah, there's there's real there's real disruptive potential there, and this takes us back to the beginning of our conversation. There's also always the danger of being, of being misunderstood, right? Of being associated with anarchy as opposed to anarchism. I've made that distinction sometimes, and you make it, you make it in your book. But there's a lot to be said for em embracing anarchy in the in the right time and place, just to show how radical and transgressive and subversive a project is. I mean, mutual aid ends up transgressive and subversive. And so sometimes, sometimes this imagery is useful. Unfortunately, frequently this imagery is not useful, but that's again, something yeah, we already spent a decent amount of time talking about. It can be harmful for sure, but we, we can't, you know, I'm also like a, have a literary background and we can't control the, the ways that like the words and images we put out there are taken up and used and rehashed right so there may be like transphobic you know uh stuff underlying there is transphobic stuff underlying these depictions of like serial killers and movies oh, yeah. no for argument. sure <laughs> yeah, but like that doesn't mean that we can't also take these things up uh with like uh and repurpose them right this is like the yeah. situationist idea too of detournement right so 
um, we can hijack their 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 images and words for our own purposes. Absolutely, that's uh, I th I think that's a great a, a great thing to leave people with. We can whatever's out there, we can hijack it. Don't don't run from it transform it and and make it you know sometimes like as you say sometimes be who they think you are even though that's not even though you're not who they think you are at all yeah all right scott thank you so okay. much for joining me thank you for writing the book the book again is is not everyday anarchism but mm -hmm. practical anarchism by scott branson <laughs> thank you so much for having me on it's great talking with you all right this was a pleasure all right thanks again to scott Happy New Year to the listeners of Everyday Anarchism. And since I am recording again, this is my chance to give you a little reminder. The reminder that I haven't been giving you lately. The show can still use your financial support. So if you can go to everydayanarchism.com and give money to keep the show going, I really could use it, especially someday, hopefully, to hire an editor. And otherwise, if you just want to keep the show healthy... You can leave a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or a five-star rating on Spotify, or you can tell a friend. And then if you just want to keep me happy, you can email me at everydayanarchismpodcast at gmail.com. I will be delighted to receive your emails. Thanks, everyone, and I will see you next time, hopefully next week. I've got a number of balls in the air, but I'm, I'm hoping to have another episode out uh, and to keep up in every week pace for another month or two then finally i think some transitions are coming but of course something else i haven't gotten to record lately the music which you're about to hear is by david hill <laughs>